Hello everyone and welcome to a tier list for the ages. Looking at the title of this video, you might be wondering what Yakuza related anniversary brought this celebration about. Well, as it turns out, this year marks the 10 year anniversary of Ryuga Gotoku Ishin, and by extension, the 1 year anniversary of its remake, Ishin Kiwami. Seeing as these games are seldom covered on YouTube these days, and how I'm a massive fan of them both, it felt right to shine a light on them through a classic subscriber special. So, here's the deal. We'll be ranking every single story boss from both Ishin games through the criteria listed here. While it might sound strange to feature a total of 54 entries, considering how Ishin Kiwami is cited as being just the original, but copied onto the Unreal Engine, the boss fights between these two games sit in a rather interesting and unique spot. Whether it be due to Trooper Card-esque abilities, some new OSTs, or even different face models, certain bosses just excel more in one game than the other, so we might as well feature all of them in this list. This goes without saying, but you can expect some heavy spoilers over the course of this video, so I'd advise you to play either of the two Ishins before watching this particular ranking. And with that out of the way, we can officially begin the tier list. Alright, the first boss of Ishin is none other than Okada Izo, a fellow member of the Tosa Loyalist Party and someone who quickly formed a rivalry with our hero, Ryoma. Long story short, Ryoma's brother figure gave us an important role in the Loyalist Party as soon as we returned to Tosa, and Izo is obviously having none of it. So now, we have to fend off against him and his four groupies. This is easily the weakest of the many fights we will have against him, as there is no dynamic intro nor QTE to make it stand out, but on the other hand, Izo's moveset is really fun to face off against, and the subsequent fights will build off of it rather well. As far as tutorial boss fights in Yakuza go, this one is honestly among the better ones, and the interactions bookending it really sell you on the excitement behind this first clash of swords. Plus, with it being placed so early in the game, this means that there are no trooper card shenanigans present in the Kiwami version either. Lastly, both fights have a unique boss theme in the form of Innocence for Violence, which was an exceptional take on the classic Nishiki family theme. All in all, I'd say both of these fights deserve a B tier, with the original being slightly better due to OG Ishin having a more balanced combat system. Also, yes, I'm well aware of the overwhelming damage output from my Kiwami footage. That's just a natural byproduct of me having platinum the game and breaking its difficulty balancing even further. Fortunately, this will become less of an issue the more we go through the list, but I thought I'd point it out regardless. Alright, next up on the list, the Masked Man. At this point in the story, Ryoma and his brother figure Takechi had a secret meeting with their father figure, Yoshida Toyo. This meeting goes exceptionally wrong, as the masked man takes Toyo's life, eventually leading us to fight the assailant one on one. Right off the bat, this is a significant jump from the previous boss, both in terms of narrative stakes and the difficulty of the fight. Masked man, or Kamo, only needs to be beaten to about 50% of his health, and despite that, this fight feels twice as challenging as the last one. This guy is much tankier than Izo, he has a greater damage output, and his 10 and Rishin style will force you to play much more defensively than before. Plus, this fight is placed right after a long battle, meaning that you'll likely be running low on health items as well, which adds to the impact of it all. Lastly, this fight marks the first use of the boss theme Essence of the Sword, which will appear a handful of times when fighting renowned 10 and Rishin users so it still stands out when compared to the standard boss theme that will be introduced and overused down the line. Back to Kamo, while he is an improvement over Izo 1, these two fights will still go into B tier for the time, cause they're still far from the peak that Ishin can deliver on. Next up, the man fellow content creator Froob affectionately refers to as Slap ass! Enter Ishin Ryuji or Saigo Kichinosuke. As Ryoma and the florist are casually exchanging crucial info in the hot spring, cause where else would you do such a thing, Saigo decides that he's not going to wait his turn with the informant. 
His time is far too precious after all. So, thanks to the intrusive nature of his interjection, we eventually wind up with a bare-ass fistfight between Ryoma and the soon-to-be Golden Dragon. This is hilarious. While we don't have a dynamic intro, the fight has one of the most iconic QTEs of the series. One that was woefully censored in the remake, leading people to riot and condemn Kiwami even further than you would have originally thought. Ironically though, the amount of fog present isn't the real issue dragging the newer fight down. Instead, it's the fact that Brawler is disgustingly underpowered in the remake. By nature of the entire game being rebalanced around the trooper card additions, and every sword having a substantial boost in damage numbers, this essentially leaves Brawler in the same position as Freelancer in the turn-based games. And since you're forced to fight Saigo using only the Brawler style, this makes for a distinct exercise in frustration, should you be underleveled. Not just that, but his attacks in the second phase of the remake have a lightning property, forcing you to play even more cautiously as you're picking away at his health like you are a mosquito. Again, I realize just how dumb this sounds, considering I've achieved a limit break in the footage, but just trust me, it was bad on a new game file. Thankfully, both fights featured the unique theme as a man, as a brave, to improve on the vibe. But where does all of this leave us? Well, I'll put the original fight in A tier and the remake's fights into C tier. Might sound like a harsh discrepancy, but between the difference in damage output and stun attacks, this fight greatly suffered from Kiwami's rebalancing choices. Now, in the same chapter, we also have Izo 2. Narrative-wise, it's been a year since we last crossed swords with him, and so our rematch in Mukurogai serves a dual purpose. It allows Izo to show his strength and ability to Ryoma, and to test if Ryoma himself has gone soft in the past year. Thus, in order to ensure that we'd still be of use to the Loyalist Party's plans, we have a boss fight that is essentially like Izo 1, but significantly better. This fight marks the first use of a QTE that will be repeated in every subsequent fight with him, and the arena where we fight is a lot bigger than the last one, allowing for some smoother maneuvering as we get rid of Izo's comrades. Mechanically speaking, there are little to no differences between this fight in the original versus the remake. So, just like before, both of these will be placed into B tier. I'm already looking forward to the next match. Now, the next entry is an interesting one, because it's our first fight against Nagakura Shimpachi. In our quest to seek revenge against our father's assailant, we wind up reaching the Shinsengumi HQ, seeing as the members of this group are the only ones who use the Tenenrishin sword style. In order to join the Shinsengumi ranks though, we need to defeat Nagakura. And considering the rumors about how bloodthirsty this group really is, this adds a ton of pressure to our fight with him. Nagakura is essentially an upgraded version of our fight with the Masked Man. He's even more aggressive, while retaining a similar health pool, but this time round, there is no 50% stipulation preventing you from going balls out. It's a great fight, honestly. Perhaps being the most concise when it comes to exhibiting a pure Tenen Rishin moveset, without specific character quirks being sprinkled in. Not just that, but Nagakura as a character really threads the line between Yakuza 4 Saejima and Yakuza 5 Saejima perfectly. It's because of this that the cutscenes surrounding this fight felt so believable, with genuine stakes to consider. Now, what's the difference between the OG and the remake? Well, OST-wise, the remake is better as it replaces the Essence of the Sword OST with Eternal Fire, a remix of Saejima's Yakuza 4 theme. Moveset-wise though, the Kiwami fight is a lot more annoying. Nagakura's sword gets a lightning property that will likely stun the hell out of you, thus turning a challenging but fair fight from before into quite an annoyance. It's basically what we had with Saigo, but slightly less bothersome. So, much like in the previous case, the OG version will go into a low A tier, and the remake into a high C tier. After this, we have the Man in White, aka Yamanami Keisuke. Long story short, he's a Shinsengumi captain that we have to erase to prove our conviction to the demon vice commander of the group, Hijikata. The fight itself is pretty disappointing though, 
As the only thing to take note of is that Yamanami has a highly telegraphed parry stance that you'll need to take note of. Other than that, the guy doesn't even say a word, and he just dies once the fight is over. Both of these entries are easy contenders for D tier, and the switch in face models didn't change things in the slightest. Next, we... oh... <laughs> oh god, okay. Akimoto, for some reason. Okay, the only reason this twat is on the list is because he has a personalized title card, nothing more. As it turns out, he's trying to desert the Shinsengumi, seeing as he only joined their ranks for the fame and status. Now, when he sees Mizuki flirting with Ryoma, he draws a sword on us, leading to this joke of a fight. If we look at the remake specifically, this has the added distinction of being the first fight to feature the generic boss theme before the Sasankwa falls, a song you'll be more than sick of from its overuse in the original Ishin. After the fight, Iryoma tries to let Akimoto go, but the guy gets slashed by Todo, except he apparently survives this, cause you can recruit him in Mukurogai later and… <sighs> oh, for the love of god… what more could I say about this guy? The best thing about his appearance here is that this is the last time we'll have to see either him or Mizuki in these games again. Unless I happen to block out one of the subsequent appearances from my memory, like I've been trying to do with the stupid Avatarian. Wait, we're going off topic. Uh, to no one's surprise, these two entries are crown examples of D tier placements. So we'll relegate them to the very bottom of the list and pretend this detour never even happened. Thankfully, the next fight on the list is a proper return to form as our wonderful rival Izo returns for our very first one-on-one -on -one fight with him. He's now well known as Izo the Butcher, and Ryoma is well known as Saito Hajime. So we have an interesting case of two guys putting their respective newfound legacies on the line, cause the outcome of this fight could have serious consequences for both of their respective journeys. If Ryoma loses, Izo will probably end him right then and there, just like he did with the other two Shinsengumi captains. And if Izo loses, it will be a devastating blow to the Loyalist Party's plans. So off we go. This is the last case of the song Innocence for Violence being used as a boss theme, and the fight it is bound to is yet another improvement over the previous one, cause now we don't have to bother with some annoying lackeys distracting us. We just have a solid fight between two swordsmen of comparable skill. These specific fights will go to the top of B tier, and man, I can't wait until we get to the last one, cause that's the fight that will retroactively make all of the previous ones so much better. If you're curious about why that is, I'd recommend this video, cause going in depth on any of these bosses here would likely extend the tier list well past the 2 hour mark. Anyway, let's get back on track. Following this, we have Yoshida Toshimaro. And as I'm sure you can guess just from looking at the footage, these fights aren't gonna be anything to write home about. Yoshida is a member of the Choshu Loyalists, and as such, he's very much opposed to the current political state of Japan. His 9 trillion IQ plan to bring back the country to its former glory is to blow up a wall and abduct the emperor. Yep, I'm serious. So we obviously have to stop him, because potentially burning down an entire city is definitely not something a Shinsengumi officer would ever stand for. Unfortunately, there isn't that much else to say about the boss. He just uses attacks with long windups and hits like a truck. With regards to the remake, we actually use a unique OST in the form of Pray Me Revive, which makes sense considering the recasting. But then, on the other hand, he was also given a lightning property like Nagakura before him, making this fight in a cramped interior even more tedious than before. Once again, we have two easy D tier placements. Fortunately though, the fight after Yoshida has us go up against another member of the Choshu loyalists, more specifically, their leader, Mr. Zurajanai Katsurada, <laughs> and I really really hope someone got this reference. <laughs> Indeed, it is time we fight against Ishin Akiyama, i.e. Katsura Kogoro, a man with a reputation for being quite the escape artist and someone who puts us in a tough position. See, we've already met Katsura a number of times before this fight, and even though Ryoma is currently on a path of revenge, ridding the world of Katsura would be meaningless. 
Plus, he seems to know some crucial info on our now estranged brother Takechi. So the idea going into this encounter is that we'll have a pretend fight, ending with Katsura giving us the slip. Now, the fight itself is exceptionally fun, as it has all of the agility of the classic Akiyama moveset, embellished further with some really stylish swordplay. Not just that, but this is also an example of a fight that was actually improved upon in the remake, with the new version giving Katsura a unique boss theme in the form of pseudo-fight. Now, personally, I'm really not a fan of trap music, and I think that the original version of this theme was significantly better. But the new track does fit the trickster nature of the character pretty well, and the fight is just as challenging as it needs to be, with no superpowers spoiling the fun. So with all of that in mind, our boy Katsura will reside firmly in A tier. After this Choshu Fiesta, we finally get to go head to head with the mysterious leader of the Shinsengumi, Kondo Isami. Being one of the most skilled Tenen Rishin users, he's been one of our top suspects for actually being the masked man, which led to Ryoma trying to seek an audience with him for most of chapter 7. Now, when looking at his overall arc, Kondo is an interesting character, holding all of the answers we need and being incredibly cheeky about it, to the point where I'd say recasting him as Adachi was actually an improvement over the original version. Unfortunately though, the fights with him weren't a comparable home run. On the one hand, Kondo has a cool QTE in the middle, and a unique boss theme that's a remix of the Essence of the Sword theme. On the other hand, he is easily the most annoying Tenen Rishin user to fight against for a number of reasons. To start off, one of his stances is basically a Komaki knockback equivalent that he spams incessantly compared to the other Shinsengumi captains. Then, when he's not blocking, he has an attack that can stunlock you over and over again if you're not careful. Neither of these things would be a massive issue, in theory, if not for the fact that this is the fourth Tenen Edition user we fought thus far, with each of the Soulsmen utilizing it having little to no distinction between their approaches to it. At the very least, the version in Kiwami differentiates itself from the other fights by giving him a fireball attack, which is very well telegraphed and easy to counter. In conclusion, the narrative introduction to the character was promising, and while I may have my personal gripes with the current moveset, the presentation of the fight still elevates it to a B tier, overall. Thankfully, the next entry on the list will give us a much needed freshness to the Tenen Rishin moveset. Okta, my boy! Your first fight is S tier worthy, and I have no idea where to begin while describing it. So, our first clash with him happened as soon as we joined the Shinsengumi, and this cutscene fight ended in a draw. Now, jump forward a few chapters and you'll have Okita inviting us over to a raid of Sengoku Castle. By the end of this endeavor, we realized that it was all an elaborate setup so that we could have our rematch, and Okita even goads Ryoma into believing he was the mysterious masked man who slayed Yoshida Toyo. What came afterwards was a god-tier boss fight. With a beautiful dynamic intro, a QTE that signals a switch-up in Okita's moveset, and it's all supported by one of the best versions of Receive You thus far. If all of that wasn't enough, the Mad Dog's take on the Ten Edition style is absolutely its own beast, as it swings the Sodachi like a wild animal, with all the agility you're accustomed to seeing from the mainline fights. Do we really need to say anything else? Like, I realize I have a ton of bias towards Majima, but this is still one of the finest fights in Ishin, and even the new explosion attack is a solid addition in the remake thanks to it being, again, well telegraphed and easy to block. I love these fights, and I think both of them deserve to go into S tier. Coming up next, we have one of the most unique fights in the series, as we face off against the tag team of Katsura and Saigo. So, here's some context. These two belong to rival factions, and are constantly at the Shara's throats, except this time around, they fortunately have someone to knock some sense into them. Ryoma has been drinking his way through Kyo due to the news of Takechi dying in Tosa, and in this drunken state, he suggests a three-way fistfight so that everyone can get the frustration out of their systems. This naturally means they were once again stuck in brawler style, but unlike with the first Saigo fight, 
RGG was generous enough to give us a ton of environmental objects to use. Even though these two can be relentless in their attacks, the fight itself is absurdly fun. And it concludes with a night out with the boys that winds up changing history, quite literally. We have a glorious QTE, which seems to be a rare luxury with Ishin's bosses, and the two versions of the fight have different yet unique boss themes. The original features the Rhapsody of Chivalry, and the remake features Town Bully. So, what's the verdict? Well, the OG version just barely misses out on S tier, while the remake gets a low A tier. While the brawler nerfs are less annoying to deal with here, they still damage the flow of the fight extensively. And plus, the original OST was a significantly better fit to elevate the fights even further. But yeah, still one of my favorite boss fights. Up next, we have the second fight with Okita. The story going into this one is a lot more grim compared to the first one. Unbeknownst to Ryoma, a man who stole his identity has taken the life of Inoue, who we're told was in fact the masked man that the real Ryoma was searching for. Okita believes that we knew about this all along, and that we were to blame for his mentor's demise, leading to a somber fight. This time round, Okita is largely sticking to a more standard approach to Tenen Rishin, which is a bit of a downgrade, personally speaking. But the act of doing this has immeasurable narrative weight to it. More on that will be spoken about during a dedicated Okita Soji analysis, because of course I want to do one. As for the OST, the song Receive and Doubt You is a bit of a mixed bag, as I've already stated in the Receive You tier list. But it's still a decent song, and while this fight doesn't have a dynamic intro, it does have a QTE, and a different one from the previous fight, which is a welcome plus. Overall, I'd say both of these fights are a high A tier. Less amazing than the first fight, but still a sight to behold. Alright, next we have Komuso, i.e. the other Sakamoto Ryoma, i.e. again, the surprisingly very alive Takechi Hampeta. Frankly, this would be a D-tier fight if not for two things. Number one, the narrative twist elevates the encounter substantially. And number two, we get to fight him and his supporters alongside Okita Soji. Other than that, it's a pretty by-the-numbers boss with a generic boss name. And thankfully, no superpower shenanigans. So thanks to its uniquely average nature, I'll give it a very generous C tier. Who's na- Hey, Daigo, you're moving up in the world! Alright, so remember the name Tokugawa that was uttered about a hundred times in both Ishin and Kenzan? Well, the current head of that family is none other than Tokugawa Yoshinobu. He's basically the be-all and all of the country. So, if Ryoma wants the Great Restoration to succeed, he needs to get Ishin Daigo here to politely step down from his position of power. Tokugawa is amused by the notion that Ryoma fought his way through the castle with the supposed goal of saving the country, so he graces him with an honorable duel. No one is allowed to interfere, and this makes for one of the coolest boss fights in the franchise. The man in charge is fairly straightforward in his attacks, and the only thing that could annoy you about fighting him are the daggers he likes to throw, which can stun you. Fortunately, it's all well telegraphed and you can block them with ease. One funny thing to note though, is how in the remake, one of the earlier versions of the game had a glitch where the daggers he'd throw would hang suspended in the air, so you'd have to carefully navigate the arena not to get stunned at a later point in the fight. This oddity, to no one's surprise, was later patched out. Also in the remake, Tokugawa has a special ability akin to the Rahul Koli Trooper card, which means you can only attack him via the gunman style until the animation concludes. But this is hardly an issue, thanks to again, the way it is all presented, cause you can easily plan around it. Lastly, the boss theme, La Muerte del Gobierno, is an ethereal delight that I've attempted to cover in the past, easily one of my favorite songs in the series. As you may have expected due to my lack of criticism, I think both iterations of this fight are easy as tier placements, and their narrative resolutions are just as beautiful as the combat that preceded them. Moving on to chapter 12, 
we have the first of three major boss fights that adorn this city in flames. This is Sasaki Tadasaburo, leader of the Mimawarigumi. Yes, that is a mouthful. This group, just like the Shinsengumi on the surface, are in support of the Tokugawa family, but they're a lot more pompous about it. Frankly, this elite police force doesn't even remotely live up to the elite part of the namesake, as they only serve as annoying roadblocks to our progression with little to no character to them. And man, do I hate the fact that my boy Watase has to take part in all of that. His character here has none of that swagger we were used to in Yakuza 5, and the fight against him is as basic as it gets. The one thing that elevates it, much like the Komuso fight, is that Okita is once again by our side. Not to mention, the narrative stakes are exceptionally high here, because every second can make a difference, as we're trying to save Kyo from being reduced to ash. Now, in praise of the remake's take on the fight, Sasaki is actually given a unique boss team, called Collision of Our Swords, a fantastic remix of the Yakuza 5 theme. However, this new version of the fight is ultimately brought down by the fact that Sasaki is given a weird lightning attack. Since the logical way of dealing with this boss fight is to get rid of the adds first, this means that Sakaki will just keep chasing you around the arena, poking and prodding like he's trying to give you a rectal exam. And thanks to his new shiny ability, this means you'll keep falling to the ground writhing in pain for much of this very encounter, especially on the higher difficulties. It was an unnecessary addition. But I still wouldn't say that this fight deserves a D tier, cause the fights in that tier are, well, honestly, just awful. <laughs> the Sasaki fight merely fails to excel in any unique way, but at least it's not overtly rage-inducing or boring to get through. But it is very, very close. Anyway, next on the list is Mr. Harada Sanosuke. As you would expect from a guy burying Aizawa's face, the fight we have is an entertaining sight. And this time, it is backed up by consistent writing from start to finish. Harada is someone who fancies himself infinitely more important than he really is, and the other captains outright mock him for his numerous tantrums. He's not someone that you should sympathize with, and is a person that will go to any lengths to secure victory, no matter how cowardly the tactics may be. So, as he proclaims that he is the strongest Shinsengumi ever, and uses a gun-spear combo for the tactical advantage, we proceed to shame the hell out of him, and grant him a traitor's death. While neither version of this fight has a unique boss theme nor dynamic intro, the QTE in the middle more than makes up for it, being one of the longest and most dramatic in the game, and it's genuinely awesome. Now, the question that remains is, how do the original and Kiwami fights differ from one another? Well, while I'd usually chalk up the preference of OG fights to reasons related to more polished combat, here the situation is a bit more unique. See, I've played Ishin Kiwami on the PS5, and while it's clearly not running at the originally intended 60 frames per second, this fight is the most obvious example where the game's performance falters. It is likely due to the overbearing fire effects, but the game will noticeably stutter throughout the fight though never reaching the levels of, let's say, Shinamon in PS4 Judgment. So for once, due to performance oddities, the Kiwami version will be ranked slightly lower than the OG, but both fights are nonetheless solid A-tier contenders. If you're curious why it's not an S-tier, it's because the S-tier fights are figuratively, and literally, in a league of their own, and the next entry is arguably the perfect example for that. If there is one word that could describe the final fight with Okada Izo, it would be perfection. This fight is genuine, utter perfection. You have a flawless dynamic intro, the best version of Nishiki's theme in the form of For My Sake, the return of the classic QTE from the previous fights, and the addition of a brand new QTE. The arena where we fight him is the largest one we've had thus far, and the thematic conclusion of our rivalry with Izo carries about as much emotional weight as the fight with Nishiki in Yakuza 1. These are the reasons why Izo was the first Ishin character I decided to fully deconstruct on the channel, cause this fight just nails everything. The only notable difference between the OG's and the remake's version is that Izo gets a hurricane attack that can inflict poison on the player, 
but much like the fireballs of old, it's easy to guard against. And it's even a great thematic addition to what the character is like, through the persona of the infamous Butcher. These two are some of the easiest S-tier placements, and yet, there's still one more fight that manages to undo even this exemplary clash. But more on that later. In the next chapter, we have Takeda Kanryusai. Frankly, there isn't that much to say here. This character is an opportunist who will betray anyone as long as he is taken care of. His interaction with Ikumatsu is utterly disgusting, and his moveset is basically Arase from Kiwami 1, which is to say, really, really bad. There are no QTEs or dynamic intros to speak of, not that this character would deserve them in the first place, and the only improvement that the Kiwami version brings is lending Amano's boss team from Zero to the fight, which is a strangely good fit to Ishin's other OSTs. At the same time though, Kiwami also gave his bullets a poison property, but I won't dwell on that now, cause we fought against this moveset about a quadrillion times by now, so everything about the fight just feels old hat. Kanryusai gets a D tier any way you cut it, so let's just hurry on to the finale. Now, before we actually fight the many final villains in Ishin, we first have a friendly suggestion from our Shinsengumi comrades to consider. The following six entries are related to sparring matches with Nagakura, Hijikata and Okita, respectively. If you fought them before, these fights will carry the same positives and negatives between them, minus the QTEs and dynamic intros. Both Nagakura fights will go into C tier, due to the 10 edition fatigue coupled with the fact that we already fought him earlier on. This time around, even though he says he's fighting more seriously, he doesn't stand a chance against us thanks to our improved stats and mobility. That aside, the fight we have after him is a bit more special. It's the fight against Hijikata Toshizo. Now, I am going to be biased as hell with this entry, so please bear with me. The fact we get to fight Hijikata at all is something that RGG didn't technically have to do, but they did, and I want to thank them profusely for that. Hijikata's character writing alone is a fantastic extension to Mines, retaining all of the more compassionate sides to the character, but without discarding the brutality and tactical tendencies he exhibited. The fight against him might actually be my favorite of all the more by-the-book Tenen Edition fights, because Hijikata takes a few subtle deviations from the likes of Kondo, Nagakura or Yamanami while using the style. These three tend to focus a lot more on playing defensively until they get a chance to perpetually stun you or abuse a parry stance, which gets old rather quickly. On the other hand, someone like Okita basically draws from the more Majima-centric combat approaches than a standard Tenen Rishin. So then, looking at Hijikata, you might actually see him as a bit of a middle ground, though admittedly drawing more from the agile side of swordsmanship. He substitutes the incessant knockback spamming of his elders with precision-based attacks and deliberate movement, making the fight feel like an elegant tango of swords. Beyond that, if you're acquainted with the stories of the real-life Hijikata, this here is probably the most anticipated fight you could hope to see, considering the demon vice commander's reputation in the world. And even if I wasn't going to be biased over this fight due to the Mina affiliations, I was definitely going to be biased due to the number of Gintama parallels. Also, please watch Gintama, it's a fantastic series. Since the OG fight feels like an equilibrium of so many things to me, I'll give it an exceptionally generous low A tier. But what about the fight in the remake? Well, it takes any perceivable positive of the original and finally pushes it to an extreme. I mean, just look at the boss team. We turned Fly into an even more powerful song through the remix called Soar. The song was tuned down to drop C sharp, which warms my Trivium adoring heart. The composers added more aggressive drum passages in the verses, and we even have a proper black metal style blast beat in the chorus. As is very well documented on the channel, I am a metalhead. And adding a blast beat into a song that was already this epic is just... Mwah. Chef's kiss. Also, the fireball attack that Hijikata has in Kiwami is completely on brand for the whole demon motif, and, well, I'm sure you can tell just how much I enjoy this fight from the footage that is featured. 
Again, biased as it may be, I adore this fight, and I will give it an S tier. Anyway, enough gushing for the time, let's move on to Okita. This fight is basically in the same boat as Shinpachi's, except here we return to the first boss team in the remake, which I very much appreciate. It's all really fun, but we've fought the man twice already, so I can't place it too high on the list, considering the lack of narrative stakes. This time around, due to the added exposure, I'll just put both of these fights into B tier, with the remake being higher because it actually had the personalized boss team present, which was for some reason replaced with the generic boss team in the OG version. I've no idea why that is, but yeah. That about wraps up our sparring sessions. And so, after palling around with the Shinsengumi boys, we make way for Tosa, where we have four bosses to slice through. Much like in Chapter 12, Sasaki is the first one to take a stab at fighting us. With that in mind, is there anything different about this encounter when comparing it to the last? Well, in a stark contrast to the previous conversation, Sasaki says he will support the side which will ensure that a war for the ages actually occurs, which in this case means that he's siding with Takechi. Oh yeah, I should've probably mentioned, but Takechi has basically become our top priority over the course of the chapter right before the finale. As for the fight, the only thing that improves this one over the last one is that here we're in a larger arena, and we're fighting alongside not just Okita, but also Nagakura and Hijikata. Other than that, the Kiwami fight is just as flawed as the last one, with the same rectal exam related shenanigans. Yeah, as you would have guessed, I wasn't a big fan of these fights, and I will once again relegate them to a C tier. Just like in Yakuza 5, Watase genuinely deserved a better boss fight. Next, we have one of the most disappointing and downright insulting boss fights in all of Ishin, Ito Kashitaro. His character is just a power-hungry Shinsengumi captain who is obviously vying for the leader's seat and tried usurping the throne in the scummiest of ways. He hides behind his playthings much like many other bosses, so even though we fight him alongside Hijikata and Okita, the fight is basically all that we've seen before, but finally reaching the point of overexposure. The only thing this fight allows for is to separate Hijikata from the crew and have him deal with the traitor in a way only a demon vice commander can. That's it. Now, as for the Kiwami fight, I have quite the bone to pick with whoever cast Kuze into this role. To clarify, Hitoshi Ozawa is a sweetheart, as are all of the Dojima lieutenant actors, but their inclusions in this game don't fit in the slightest. All three of them have embodied their respective Yakuza 0 roles so flawlessly that you won't be able to separate them from those identities in Ishin. And I can already guess that someone will say you shouldn't see the Ishin variants through the lens of the mainline characters, but here's the thing. In OG Ishin, nearly every character that was reused was used as an expansion on the intricacies of their mainline iterations. This is why the likes of Izo, Okita, Hijikata and Ryoma are so frequently praised by the people who played Ishin in the past. Putting Kuze's face onto this character is as dissonant as you can get, because it basically draws from the way that Kuze's character was interpreted at the very beginning of Yakuza 0, undermining the entirety of his development and what made Kuze so beloved in the first place. Had it not been for that fanfare, I doubt that he would have been one of the top contenders for this homage of sorts, so you could see why this would be a problem. Even if I put this personal grievance aside, the Kiwami version suffers from something even greater when it comes to the boss fight itself. See, in the original, the smoke, which made the fight feel like a game of hide and seek, was used for Ito to try and attack you in the most cowardly ways because, well, he could. However, in Ishin, this smoke never subsides, making this fight an utter annoyance to play through. As a final nail in the coffin, wasting a song like Pledge of Demon onto a character like Ito is just awful, I'm sorry. Neither of these deserve anything higher than a D tier. On a brighter note, the final fight before… well, the final fight is the one against Thomas Glamorchan, i.e. Ishin Richardson. First off, it's a hilarious twist that the infamous gun trader is Andre himself. His Japanese is only a few shades less hilarious than Gary's, and the fight itself is 
honestly just absurd. We have an amount of enemies that would feel like an average fight in Gaiden, we have two helpful contraptions of bullet hell to the side, and we have Okita to hopefully ward off some heat, which helps about 20% of the time. But hey, it's surprisingly not as awful as the Kandyu side fight, even though Richardson basically has the same moveset. And it's not even as bad as the Ito fight, cause I can actually see what the hell is going on most of the time. Because of all of this, I will give Glamour-chan a very generous C tier, cause at least we got to end this team separation formula with a tiny bit of hilarity. And this also means we can finally move on to the true peak of Ishin. Takechi Hampeta. Christ almighty, what a fight. Whether or not you're a fan of Ishin, nearly everyone in the community adores this fight. If you see a top 10 greatest Yakuza boss fight, Takechi is almost always there. Perhaps even in the top 3, alongside the final bosses of Gaiden and Yakuza 5. The fight is just that good on a mechanical level. The boss theme is an 8 minute epic and it's bloody impeccable. Mind you, while I am a fan of prog and longer songs, I hate when a long song can't seem to justify its length. But the assassination of Bodhisattva absolutely does justify it. Now, as for the story, it would take way too long to explain all of the intricacies surrounding it. So just think of this as two brothers clashing, as one of them let his latent feelings of inferiority and hint of brotherly rivalry expand into something much greater than the two of them. So now, whoever wins the fight will prove that their view on how Japan could thrive again was genuinely the right one. Putting aside the political side of the matter, it is as simple as a brother fighting a brother, which is exactly why the recasting of Takechi as Shibusawa in the remake is a major sticking point. You know how Kiryu and Nishiki have this brother versus brother dynamic? that is literally the culmination of the first Yakuza game? Well, the writers probably realized that with the amount of parallels Ishin has with that game, that putting Nishiki into the role of Takechi would likely just be a dead giveaway to the final few plot twists. So they gave Takechi's role to a brand new face, and frankly, it worked out brilliantly in the original. Now, moving on to Kiwami, the fact that we have one of the final bosses of the most popular Yakuza game to date present from the very beginning of the story in a brotherly role was likely the biggest giveaway that he'd be the final boss yet again. Though ironically, due to how amazingly Hideo Nakano embodied Shibusawa, similarly to the Kuze predicament from earlier, I just couldn't buy this brother dynamic with Ryoma in the remake. It took away a lot of the emotional impact of the fight, and in a series like Yakuza, communicating emotion is a massive part of what makes the bosses so memorable. And yet, even with this hindrance, I'd say the voice actor did a fantastic job with his role. And when looking at the bigger picture, both versions of this fight are absolutely S-tier material. The OG reaches the very top of the list for obvious reasons, cause with the number of casualties in this game, seeing an unfamiliar face get presumably killed off dropped my guard, so to speak, which made the later reveals and betrayals in the story offer even more weight to the fight. And the fight itself is just magnificent. With a dynamic intro that doubles as a QTE, another QTE between the first and second phase, and an action sequence before the final phase as you fight beneath the moonlight. Takechi will even switch styles to keep pace with you, starting off with Swordsman, then switching to Wild Dancer, and finally finishing the fight off with a classic Clash of Swords. To add to this, the remake gives Takechi some extra abilities, one of which includes Sasaki's lightning bolt thing, which is not ideal, and the other being the Nishitani Trooper card ability. Still, even with my now well-documented disdain of stun effects, this fight was still more than a worthy climax to our journey, and it simply made me appreciate the original fight even more than before. So yeah, we'll conclude the tier list with two S tiers. With that, we are officially done with the anniversary tier list. Apologies for the more nitpicky or rambly bits, but I've played both of these games for countless hours, so there was a lot of things that I wanted to cover. I absolutely adore these games, and yes, this includes the remake, cause while I realize that the consensus on it is leaning more so on the negative side, I still enjoy it a ton. Anyway, let me know what your favorite boss fight in either Ishin game is, 
and what other topics you would like to see on the channel. If it's a unique subscriber special, a character analysis, a meme video or whatever, shoot your suggestion in the comments. Thank you for everything thus far and I'll do my best to keep making material that we all enjoy. So, until next time, take care of yourselves and have a great day. Cheers!